Let's put our heads together. Let's start a new country up. Our father's father's father tried, erase the parts he didn't like. You may recognize the opening lyrics of Cuyahoga, a song by R.E.M. from its 1986 album, Life's Rich Pageant. If you read me, many of my blog posts are based in a song or a lyric, and in this presentation, you'll see a handful of the musical references that I found useful in, help in, in preparing today's talk. A year ago, I stood here and claimed that we'd entered an era of content abundance, one that's forcing publishers to rethink how they create, manage, and disseminate content. I cited four implications of abundance. The first was that our content has to become open, accessible, and interoperable. The second, that we need to focus more clearly on using context to promote discovery. The third is that trying to compete on the cost of content is a losing proposition. We need instead to focus on broader uses of, those con of our content. And then the final piece, and you've heard a lot about it in the last couple of days, is that we need to distinguish ourselves by providing readers with tools that help them manage abundance. Much of my thinking at that time centered on what publishers themselves could do to succeed in a content abundant universe. Since then, I've been kicking around what abundance might mean for our industry, not just publishers, but also authors, agents, distributors, wholesalers, retailers, libraries, and others. Increasingly, I've come to think that we all have to hang together or surely we will hang separately. Specifically, I think we need four things. We need goals, a redefinition of what publishing is and why it matters. I think we need to reposition publishing as the engine of the engagement economy. Second, we need rules, a set of principles that are based in fairness and recognize that we have to balance concurrent requirements, particularly of the supply chain, with some, perhaps many, future unknowns. Third, we need feedback. We need a shared model that lets us look at new approaches, test assumptions, and make decisions based in facts where they're available. And finally, we need a hook. We need a reason to collaborate. I'm going to return to these ideas in a moment, and all of them draw upon recent work done by Jane McGonigal. But first, I'd like to talk a little bit more about abundance. I'm hardly the first person to do so. Michael Hart, who Brewster invited us to remember a few minutes ago. Ah. Thought that portable petabyte storage capable of holding a billion, a billion e-books would be available to a middle class citizen by the year 2021. I'm not sure how optimistic he might have been about the prospects of a middle class in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the idea of portable petabyte storage. Technology advances bear them out. 2011 marks the 40th anniversary, not just of Project Gutenberg, but also the introduction of the first microprocessor. In the last four decades, the number of transistors, transistors that we can squeeze on a chip has grown from 2,300 to 3.1 billion, while clock speeds have improved nearly 4,000 fold. Now, much is abundance is the precursor to the development of context, capacity is the precursor to abundance. Moore's law got us to where we are, and while growth in digital capacity may slow, it's not going to stop. And this capacity is rewriting the rules of the publishing supply chain. In an exchange that took place a few years ago, Michael Hart predicted a reading-enabled future in which book prices plummet, literacy and education rates soar, and old power structures crumble in the wake of scientific, industrial, and humanitarian revolutions. You know, that's kind of cool if you're part of the proletariat, uh, but it might be a bit unnerving if you're an oligarch or aspiring to be one. Now, some folks could rightly claim that a little revolution every now and then is a good thing, and I won't argue with them. But I've been wondering if we might get a lot closer to the next enlightenment without having to roll out a 21st century guillotine. That is, I've been wondering if there's an opportunity in abundance. 
I started out thinking that the answer might be elusive. Most of us would accept that the supply chain that we've built to handle physical books is complicated. That is, it's constructed to promote efficiency and ultimately lower transaction costs as a percentage or share of total revenue. Hampered by the gravity of success, it isn't really built to adapt quickly or to promote investment in new markets. Any supply chain, though, is a system, a collection of processes, tools, and participants. The extent to which the system can be described as complicated is a function of nodes and relationships. The more participants you have, the more complicated the system. But even a complicated system is predictable. That is, if you know the inputs, you can reliably predict what the results might be. By way of comparison, the current com supply chain that we have is complex. Increasingly, the publishing value chain, can no longer under we can no longer understand the whole simply by looking at the sum of its parts. And though we compete on context, metadata is largely assigned and managed at arm by arm's length intermediaries. The current supply chain was not designed, actually, to provide publishers with an understanding of how, where, and why content is consumed. It's this unaddressed complexity that's begun to erode supply chain predictability. New technologies don't just lower transaction costs. They eliminate some transactions entirely. Ultimately, eliminating transactions means eliminating some components of the supply chain. So managing complex ecosystems requires new approaches, ones that Martin Reeves and Mike Daimler, both of the Boston Consulting Group, describe this way. Increasingly, industry structures better characterized as competing webs or ecosystems of codependent companies than as a handful of competitors producing similar goods and services and interacting in a st with a stable, distant, and transactional supply chain. In such an env environment, competitive advantage follows to those companies that can create effective strategies at the network or system level. So when I started working through these ideas, I wondered if we had the tools in place to effectively negotiate to our way to a new order. In a stable environment, most supply chain issues can be resolved really as two parties, one issue negotiations. If you think about things like discount rates, shipping terms, library lending, royalty rights, territorial rights, those all are examples of, one, of two parties, one issue. Sometimes these two party, one issues discussions play out in a series of distinct negotiations, often between the individual supply chain partners. And while this makes individual negotiations more manageable, it also reduces the likelihood that options beneficial to anyone not at the table at the time of the negotiations might actually be introduced. Now, magazine publishers faced this situation early in 2010 when Anderson News and Source Interlink, two of the largest single copy wholesalers, asked for new terms on handling newsstand copies. Publishers balked, Source Interlink eventually backed down, but Anderson News invoked its BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, and closed down its distribution business. I feel for Anderson. Newsstand distribution is a tough business, and Anderson le left it claiming that they were losing money. For several reasons, magazine publishers act in a counterintuitive fashion. They push too many copies into the supply chain, and the average magazine sells only a third of its newsstand draw. The cost of handling returns can be enormous. But with Anderson's overnight exit, Magazine publishers lost 40% of the supply chain capacity for newsstand distribution, a situation that took months and millions of dollars in lost revenue to work out. We worry about things like the loss of retail space at borders, but we really haven't reached a real cliff yet. As we transition from print only to a blended product and service supply chain, focusing on our, on our, only on our immediate needs runs the risk that we will lose a significant supply chain cog that could include libraries, wholesalers, or retailers. In the current complex system, we don't fully understand the value added by any of these important supply chain partners, and losing them can and does create a series of unintended consequences. So abundance hasn't really gutted the old rules, but it's rendered them certainly somewhat inadequate. 
And as Peter Brantley pointed out last year, we're trying to extend agreements that were made 40 to even 70 years ago. We live in a time when new entrants, new content forms, and new distribution op options have created a maelstrom of variety. So using serial negotiations between two parties makes it impossible to revamp our supply chain. What we need is a new approach, many parties negotiating many issues simultaneously. In the last 50 years or so, a lot of good work has been done to explore and refine the development of multi-party agreements. An example dating back to the 1960s, the so-called Law of the Sea, sought to establish a system of payments for the right to mine extraterritorial seabeds. Early in the negotiations, the participating nations agreed that, and I'll quote here, common heritage of mankind should not be prematurely exploited by those who happen to be ahead. That's a notion many pub publishers might find comforting. As an international negotiation, Law of the Sea involved literally hundreds of participants and waded through dozens of really meaty, significant issues, how mining might be financed, what royalty rates might be paid, what happens to royalty rates over time, how the proceeds, if anything, if any, might occur, might be allocated. The discussions needed to be win-win in that you were exploiting uh, differences among assumptions, uh, risk preferences, the need for capital. Ultimately, these complex negotiations benefited from the analytical underpinnings of a model that was actually developed uh, separately and without any direct involvement uh, at MIT with the support from the Department of Commerce. The model was introduced uh, almost by accident at a, at a critical juncture. And the data that it provided helped the negotiations fo focus instead on both near and longer term strategic interests, not just positions. An interesting example, you think, but you, you may say we, mac we lack a mechanism to make that happen. In my view, I think we just haven't made it yet. It's not that hard to leap from game theory to game design. Jane McGonigal's recent book, Reality is Broken, examined opportunities to use the principles of game design to create both a better and more immersive reality. I'd like to go back to the four things I said at the beginning and talk about what I think we need to do to reinvent publishing. The first is we need a goal. Survival is really not adequate. It doesn't motivate or sustain, and it presumes a zero-sum game or worse. I'd like to put a not-so-radical idea on the table. Abundance, digital formats, Amazon and Apple all challenge prevailing business models, but the super threat is people not engaging in an immersive reading and text-based study, which are the precursors to, to critical thinking. We live and work in a world in which we have a narrow window to influence and convince people to do what we think we need them to do. We talk about, as publishers and as members of the, of the overall supply chain, we talk about the quality, value, and importance of our work, and we view the act of publishing as validation. But the measure that matters starts with what, how what we do is received. So I propose a far bigger collective goal to reposition publishing, which for me includes the physical and digital forms of books, magazines, and newspapers, as the engine of the engagement economy. To make that happen, we need to increase the expectations we place on ourselves and on our readers, something that Craig Maud talked about uh, in brief yesterday, along the way architecting the experience of consumer interaction with our published works. Second, we need rules. For a start, I like my four implications of content abundance. If we truly want to become an engine of the engagement economy, being open, discoverable, agile, and useful are all good defining characteristics. But we also have to recognize that change, however we, we choose to define it, is going to create winners and losers, even as we need the continued support of those who might be losing out to sustain the supply chain as it exists today. Figuring out how to migrate successfully from where we are will depend upon inventing options that ultimately are based in agreements about what is fair. It will also require data that may challenge how we assign value to the various roles in the new supply chain. It's also worth noting or testing the extent to which various participants believe that growth in reading and truly immersive reading is possible. While I can position it as an imperative, the extent to which the industry grows or shrinks 
plays a major role in the willingness of various participants to collaborate, combine, or trade assets. Authors, agents, publishers, and wholesalers, or, I'm sorry, and retailers are all part of the same industry, but it's not yet clear if our belief systems are compatible or conflicting. Does Andrew Wiley, the agent, for example, really believe that digital royalties should be 50% and the cost of distribution should be zero? Do publishers really believe that royalties today need to be the same in perpetuity, or can a different model be implemented? Are libraries a source of book sales or a net drain? Questions like these and the answers that we need to get to be able to model them are the starting point. Third, we need feedback. McGonagall notes that some games are designed to give you feedback first as a, as a vehicle to learn what to do and how to play. Truthfully, we could use that now just to manage a complex supply chain. The longer the lag between action and response, the more likely it is that we'll inadvertently take actions that are in, with some frequency not in our best interest. This is where models can help. The breakthrough moments in the law of scene negotiations, as I described a moment ago, started with engagement. Participants, and participants could make assumptions explicit, plug them into the model, and see what the impact was on their return, as well as the return of everybody else who would be participating in the negotiations. Iterate that enough times, and the win-win solutions where they exist begin to show up. But to make that happen, the roles of industry associations and standard bodies will need to change substantially. At the least, now is the time to look at pooling some of their funding and potentially establishing a meaningful data-driven R&D effort. R&D isn't just about technology. Some basic research about how people find, assess, and consume content might give publishers a reason to reevaluate their arm's length engagement with libraries. And finally, we need a hook. Participation is voluntary here. Companies, institutions, and individuals will decide whether or not they play. If we want to reposition publishing, we need to provide various forms of intrinsic motivation. And we have to be willing to give, a lot, give lots of people a seat at the table. The fundamental structure of the existing supply chain is under attack. We need to figure out ways to reduce both, reduce both transactions and transaction costs or retail entities, uh, our friends in Seattle, um, will continue to do it on their own. The role of supply chain intermediaries will also need to evolve. For a period of time, possibly a long time, we're going to need the support for physical distribution of content. We may need fewer companies providing that support, and it's likely that we'll have to adjust terms to better reflect the cost of doing business on a smaller scale. But if we treat those negotiations as we have in the past, the likelihood of an Anderson news moment only grows over time. This is why I think it's time to figure out how we get publishing the game started. McGonagall talks about building superstructures, highly collaborative networks that are built on top of existing groups or organizations. It combines two or more different communities that don't already work together to help solve a big, complex problem, what she labels th super threats that no single existing organization can address on its own. I called the prospect of people not engaging with our content the publishing equivalent or manifestation of a super threat. I'd argue pretty strongly that it represents a super threat not just to publishing, but to the way we function as a country, an economy, and as part of a world order. We have a responsibility to address this threat, not just so that we can make money, although that would be nice, but because we're the ones with the ability to solve it. Other industries facing an uncertain future have banded together to form and fund superstructures. The Gas Research Institute, for example, was authorized in 1976 at a time when the natural gas industry itself was highly fragmented among producers, wholesalers, and distributors. The latter, the local distributors, often held a local monopoly. By 1981, GRI, the Gas Research Institute, was spending 60 hat. $8.5 million a year on research and development, and a total of $80.5 million on oversight as well as R&D. This represented about two-tenths of 1% of the value of wellhead gas that year. Um, the industry itself was valued at a total of about $38 billion. They took on uh, research and development in four areas. They measured their success 
in the midterm at five years, in the, in the, I'm sorry, in the near term at five years, the midterm at 10 years, and the long term at 20. Their funding was drawn from a surcharge on sales as well as government grants, and it accelerated to something north of $100 million in the mid-1980s. If you look at publishing across the United States, it's about a $40 billion business. Imagine what we could do if we could create and sustain an organization with $80 million a year in funding. It's also likely that an industry-wide commitment to actually addressing this question of engagement and the, and the use of our content would garner the external funding that most parties have been understandably reluctant to spend on narrower causes. This is the opportunity in abundance, a fighting chance to remake our industry and ourselves in a way that reflects, to borrow the phrase, our better angels. And to get there, we're going to have to cross some relatively uncharted waters. In her book, McGonagall addressed a host of fixes that she thought were um, important for addressing a reality that, in her view, is broken. I'd say that the publishing industry, and in many ways, most of the things that you've heard about over the last two days, is already getting there. I'd like to focus on three areas. First is more satisfying work. Earlier this month, at O'Reilly Media's Tools of Change conference in Frankfurt, Jason Epstein positioned on-demand technology, including the espresso, as a vehicle that would help pu publishing foster many smaller imprints. Although it still bets big, Hachette's 12 also limits its list to allow adequate time to focus on the books it signs. These ideas potentially restore human scale to publishing. In a less well-known way, think of Benetech, which works with publishers to make content accessible to the blind. As Cassia points out to me in a, in a separate email correspondence, Benetech makes content accessible in ways that benefit readers beyond their target audience. She likened uh, their work to curb cuts, which are conceived to help people in wheelchairs, but they provide benefits to anyone who pushes a baby stroller or a cart full of groceries. Second, we need a better chance, of, a better hope at success. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Just, um, reading is hard work. Innovations like WordNick, Flipboard, Small Demons, and Safari Online make it easier to find what you want, when and where you want it. They help you filter and decode a vast array of content on terms that make sense for you. I think in a similar fashion, we've entered an era of what I call rights everywhere, not as a barrier, but as an opportunity. Solutions like those in, embodied in Balabox, in effect, progressive reading as a transaction, will become commonplace. It's, it's a different approach from the arm's length way that we manage rights today, and it will require a, rethink, a, a rethinking of upstream, that is, author and agent relationships. Finally, in this area, complex systems divine, de, essentially demand a diversity of thought. In effect, diversity is the only way to manage a complex system. Considering a wide range of perspectives helps reduce the risk of failure, and a game-like reinvention of publishing gives us a chance to crowdsource experiments. Finally, a third area in which we've begun to think differently is stronger social connectivity. The experiments abound. Look around this room. You'll see and have heard from representatives from organizations like Read Social API, Read Mill, Social Book, Goodreads, Readability, Book Riff, Cursor, and more. Bob Stein has been working for more than 20 years to push the boundaries of social connectivity and reading. We all know the common questions. Who wants or needs another platform? I'd like to reposition all of these plays with a different question. How do we make sure that our platforms are at the center of public and private conversations? How do we make sure that our content is always visible, available, and relevant? I like that one. Oh. You get a conclusion. I started my remarks by talking about the way that music seeps into my thinking about words. In Andy Leibowitz's photo essay, American Music, musician, poet, and author, Patti Smith captured it this way. Our music grants us a coat of invulnerability, a spring in which we bathe with abandon, methods of response, moments of respite, and a riot of self-expression. It's the porch song, plunging youth, it's thick-veined hands squeezing 
clusters of notes from an equally thick neck. It's the Les Paul, the tenor sax. It's a platter spinning in space, etched with the words, tutti frutti. Patti Smith writes beautifully about the power of music, evoking images that may make you wonder how we will ever compete against the tidal wave of creation and consumption in media alternatives. It's worth noting, though, that she chose to do so in a book. Words inspire, motivate, and change, and they can help us shape a new reality. But first, I think we have to see this moment of abundance as the opportunity we have to reshape our business. Let's put our heads together. Let's start a new industry up. Thanks. I don't know if I have time or not. I can take two questions. Before I do, two things. First, no presentation is an island. So here's a little bit of a colophon for words, music, and friends. Uh, and I really appreciate the friends. For the folks who are trying to figure out how social writing works, uh, you should see the process that I go through to get the good feedback that made this presentation what it is today. Uh, but I particularly want to thank one particular person. Um, uh, Peter, Peter I, I th honestly, everybody I've talked to says the same thing, which is, this is such a great program, I can't believe they put me on it. <laughs> and I think the reason that we're here and the reason that people have come from such a distance for so many different reasons, for, in so many different um, uh, topics, is because we really believe uh, in your commitment to opening a dialogue that will see us through to the future of publishing, and I think everybody here appreciates that. All right, I get two questions. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Let's go home.